Well, a, a definition, again, for steward, as we started last uh, week, is, is one who manages another's property, a household, finances, or other affairs. And we're told in 1 Chronicles 22, uh, verse 15, that there were masons, who are those skilled with building with stones, in case we didn't know that, um, carpenters, craftsmen, which were all given to King Solomon to build the temple of God. And later they would also be used to repair uh, the, the um, things that needed repair as well on the house of God. Now, a house which is uncared for, though, or neglected, will beyond a doubt deteriorate and crumble eventually. It'll be gone. Now, last week, uh, David, again, King David, was praying for the temple of God before it was built. That was the biggest thing on his heart. Out of all the things that he did, he brought peace to the people of God, but the biggest thing that he had in his heart was to build the house of God. And he wasn't able to do it because he had blood on his hands. His son was a man of peace, though, with no war, thanks to his father David, so he was able to build the house of God. And he's truly honored to serve the living God. You can see it in his prayer. I mean, he knows where everything comes from. Everything he has, everything he is, is God's. And he knows it. And he is given abundantly to, to provide for the house of God. And his people, also Israel, have done the same thing. And he looks at this all and he just says, this is where we were meant to be, right here in this place. All the people of God having a heart that is so turned to them that they are, they're glad to be there. They're honored to be there. They're honored to participate in the building of God's home. And he says, God, preserve us so that we will always be at this place, that your people would always have this type of a heart that would be attuned to you. Preserve this place in us. So in 1 Peter, which is our, our passage today, Peter is the author. The rock is what his name means, is writing to Christians who are facing many challenging times to encourage them and to remind them what they are a part of, to endure and to prevail with Christ. So a little recap just on being that chapter two is where we're going to look at. Uh, in chapter one, the first part of it, Peter basically reminds I have to, I'm not checking my phone. This is my timer so that I don't go forever. <laughs> it's needed. So, um, he reminds them that, uh, that they're called by God into a living hope. God has caused us to be born again to a living hope, he says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you by God's power. And it is preserved through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the end days. In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith might be revealed and praised when Jesus comes again. All of this is preserved in heaven by the power of God through our faith. That's how we have access to it. And he says the trials are merely just showing that your faith, it strengthens your faith. It illuminates, it exposes your faith also at the same point. So he's calling them to a hope of action, right? Not just what we say, Oh, I believe in God. He says the trials are what test your faith. Embrace your hope that you have in Christ is what he's saying. So, and he also reminds them in the second part of the first chapter that they are commanded by God to be holy because God is holy. He says to Israel, be holy because I am holy. And the interesting part about it is that Peter now transfers that, which is meant for Israel, to all who believe in Christ. So everyone in the world that follows Christ now is called to be the people of God. It opens up. It's not just Israel. Anyone. That's big. Therefore, let your faith, he says at the end of it, and hope be in God and not in this world. 
So going to, we're going to look today at three sections which expose the call and the expectation the Lord has for his children in Christ as stewards of the house of God. So the first section here is believers will be a spiritual house. It says, so put away all malice, all deceit, all hi and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. Like newborn infant, infants, long for pure spiritual milk, that, it may, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tested that the Lord is good. So put all of these away. He's saying here, never do these anymore. Never do these anymore. Malice. The desire to see others suffer. Wickedness, evil things, sin, basically is what that... Deceit. That, that is, that's Satan in Genesis 3. Crafty, like the snake. He was more crafty than all the other animals. Cunning, treachery, willful, willful betrayal. Hypocrisy. You know what Jesus thinks about the hypocrisy, right? He don't like it at all. Don't, what hypocrisy means is being a play actor, acting something on the outside, acting like you're one way when really on the inside you're totally different. Avoid hypocrisy. Embrace truth, basically, is what he's saying. Envy, jealousy, that's the 10th commandment. Don't covet other people, right? Don't wish that you have possessions of others. Um, and slander, evil speech, malicious, false, defamatory statements or reports of others. Never do those things, ever. Peter says to be like infants who crave good milk, crave pure spiritual food, and be filled with the Lord. It's an invitation to sanctification. So, big word there. Justification is to be made right before God. The blood of Christ justifies us before God, and he forgives us for all sins. Sanctification is being transformed into the likeness of Christ, embracing the spiritual food and the nourishment that he gives to us and allowing him to transform us. They are different things, but they are very much connected. Some people have made justification, sanctification all in the same thing. It's not. It's definitely very different, but they should both start at the same point. But here's where people miss a lot. If sanctification is basically following God, right? It's not a matter of obedience, but it is a matter of willing to follow him. We'll make mistakes, and he gives us the ability to be forgiven. But we are embracing his spirit, his word. We are following him. We are feeding on the spiritual nourishment that he gives us. As long as we're doing that, then we are embracing sanctification, right? We might even have times where we're battling it. That's all right, though. We are trying to walk with him. It's a struggle sometimes, but we are doing that. If we are not embracing any type of sanctification, are we really following God? So are we justified? So are they connected in that sense? Yes. But other than that, it starts at the same time. That's the beginning of it. But the point is, is sanctification is a lifetime. is a lifetime of following Christ, of walking with him. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It just means that you are walking with him. You are walking in his way, in his will. You are walking with him down the path. The opposite way is clearly different. We don't even care. I don't even care what he says. I don't care what he says. I'm not going to do it. Or I know what he says and I don't want to do it anyways. This, this is my life. Keep your nose in your own business, kind of thing. That is not the follower of God. Um, that is important. So, if indeed he says you have tasted that the Lord is good, once we've truly tasted who God is, we know God and experience his real presence, he is good. And we will know that. Even his discipline is done for good purposes. Doesn't feel good, but we know it's for good. It's never done to destroy us. Satan's work is to destroy us, absolutely. God's work might not feel good, but it's always to heal us. Always. It is for good purposes, ultimately. When we experience the work of God, it is overwhelming. 
there is an awakening that's there. We can't help but to follow him. We can't help. We, we don't want to be anywhere else. Taste. You're only going to be able to taste it by following him, though. That's the only way that you can taste and see that the Lord is good. It's the only way. So, moving on. As you come to him as a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. This is big right here. Jesus is a living stone, the rock. A solid foundation or stronghold is what this means. Protection, security. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, Paul says this on the same subject matter. So it gives a different perspective is all I'm saying. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. It's talking about the cloud, the pillar of cloud that led Israel out of Egypt. That our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, the splitting of the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food. What he's talking about is by them following God out of Egypt, they were nourished by God. He supplied them. He gave them everything that they needed. He protected them. He gave them the water that they needed out of a rock. That's not normal, in case we didn't already know that. Doesn't happen. He made miracles happen. He provided where there was no provision. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. What? <laughs> the rock was Christ. The Song of Moses says, I'll come back to that in a second. The Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, 1 through 4 says, this is Moses at the end of his life. He says, for I will proclaim the name of the Lord, the name of Yahweh. The name Yahweh means the God who lives, who has life within him. He says, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. So he's calling Yahweh the rock. The rock is perfect. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. So Jesus is Yahweh is what this is saying. He is the same God that brought Israel out of Egypt. This same God, this pillar of cloud, this one that split the sea, the one that provided water out of a rock is the same one that died for our sins and now we wear his blood on us. We followed him out of Egypt. Now we follow him out of sin and out of death. And we conquered it through him. So Jesus is the rock who delivers his people, who is the one that gives his people salvation. The rock is Yahweh. It's always been that way. No one is like our rock, one of the Psalms ends up saying. Because he lives. He is the living rock, the living stone. Also, living stone visualizes the resurrection. The rock who overcomes even death, even dying, could not hold him. The living stone. And the name Yahweh who lives, again, life and dwells. So this rock was rejected by men as being worthless. They killed him. They crucified him. But he is so precious to the Father, God the Father. Precious, approved, tested, and worthy. He is invaluable. And yet humanity threw him away as nothing. The hope of God is not hope in this world, is what he's ultimately getting at all of this. The hope of God is not gold and silver. It is the precious blood of the perfect Lamb of God. You yourselves like living stones 
are being built up into a spiritual house, if he's the living stone and he's creating in us to be living stones, he is transforming us into his likeness that we become more and more and more in his image into a spiritual house. So now we have a vision of a spiritual house that is being built brick by brick by brick. And every one of us have a different gift, a different type of brick that we bring to the table. It's not just one that makes the whole thing. All of us make the house of God. We are the people. God doesn't need us. He chooses to include us in his work. I think that is just so awesome. He doesn't need us. He could just say, and sometimes he does say, watch this. Just sit down. Sit down. Just watch this. But he chooses to include us in his work. He wants to include us in his work. And the, really the right answer is for us to say thank you so much. Honored to be a part of it. If we are embracing sanctification, then we will be being transformed into these living stones raised from the dead. And what's so fascinating is that in Romans 8, 11, it says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Holy Spirit who dwells in you. Same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you and will give you life now over the grip of sin and death upon our lives. Physically, will we die? Yes. But spiritually, we are alive and being transformed internally more and more into these living stones of Christ, which together we make the house of God. Why are we being transformed? Three reasons he puts here. The first one is to be built up as a spiritual house, a place for God to reveal his presence. So the house of God is made up of many bricks like I just talked about in different shapes, but we are all there to glorify God and every one of them are important. Not one is more important than the other. Not one. Some might be in the light a little bit more as far as like in the spotlight is what I mean than others, but it doesn't mean that they're any more important than the other people that are behind the curtain. Just as important. Create a community of believers which know God and are embracing the transformation process, reflecting his image. That's what this stuff is all about. That's what these life groups are for. It's to help us to become a community of people that embrace the gifts that he's given to us. It's not easy to walk in the spirit of God. It's not easy to be embracing the transformation, the sanctification process. It's easier to be absorbed by the world because there's just more out there that's always demanding our attention. Everywhere, you've got ads and stuff that are coming from us from the streets and stuff, from magazines, from TV, from the internet, from everywhere that is trying, it's demanding our attention. And most of it has nothing to do with God's way. In fact, it takes us away from his way. But community here is meant to be a place for us to strengthen for us to encourage one another, for us to be able to help another person, for someone that, for, for an example, if I'm struggling with something and Rob then comes to me and he sees that and I can talk to him because he's my brother in Christ and I know him and he says, you know what, I know what you're going through. I've been through that before. Let me help you. Let's do this together. Satan's greatest work is when he cuts us off from the rest of the group and singles us and keeps us all by ourselves. That's when he can do the best work. When he gets us alone. We've got to fight against that. If, if, if we don't help each other in this walk, that's what the church was meant for. I can't do it all myself nor do I want to. 
All of us are needed. All of us are necessary. And all of us need to help one another to be able to do this well. Need to encourage one another. And we need to have also the humility to say that I was wrong. Please forgive me also. And also have then the mercy and forgiveness to forgive and welcome people in that forgiveness. To help. To realize we're not perfect. But that's what Satan wants. No one will love you. What you've done God doesn't love you. And if anybody else found out about you, they also wouldn't love you either. What happens? Person goes off by themselves. They might attend church, but they're all by themselves. That's where Satan does his best work. We've got to bring it in. Community will strengthen all of that if we really embrace it. To take faith, yep, because we become vulnerable, right? But it's also a test to one another. Can you trust each other? Well, be careful with it. But I'm saying is that I think that the more and more that we do love each other and spend time with each other, the more that we'll see that the answer will be yes, that we can. That we can help one another. And we can continue to grow up into the spiritual house that God has meant for us to be. Two is to be a holy priesthood. To reveal God accurately and mediate for others is ultimately what it, that's talking about. And then three is to offer acceptable sacrifices through Christ to God. Last week we talked about what an acceptable sacrifice is. An acceptable sacrifice is a sacrifice that we want to give to God. It's our best. It's our first fruit. It's our firstborn. It's the best. If we have in our heart it, even with this even, if we come and we say, do I really have to give to God? Do I, like for me, when I was younger, do I have to go to church, mom? I don't want to be there. Do I have to? The answer is no. In fact, what God would say is don't. Don't give. If that's your heart, do I have to? Then don't. He wants those that are excited to be a part of it, that are honored to be a part of it, that willingly give, that say, I can't wait to be there. I couldn't stand going to church when I was younger, but once God got a hold of me and awakened me, I could. It was my favorite part of the week. Couldn't wait to get in. Just to be in the house of God, to embrace it, because he filled me. He would heal and I could feel the feeding that he would be doing and strengthening all of that. This is what all of this is, is uh, talking about. And my attitude is this. If that is in your heart where well, I don't want to give, then I would say don't. And I would say, then we'll pray for you and hopefully that attitude will change. Hopefully one day that that attitude will change to the point of that I am honored to be a part of it. And I don't expect anybody to give more than they can. I will never be that person. On a side note, talking about money, for those of you that have like come new and been like, all he talks about is money. <laughs> I've been here two years almost exactly. I've preached on money three times. So if you figure that out, I figured that out this morning. I was like, That's 0.03% of the time that I talk about money. You just happen to come at like almost all of them. But anyway, it is important. But my, my, my attitude on all of this is that when, if our heart is in the right place, God will provide at the right time. He'll provide us with the building. He'll provide us with people. He'll provide us with growth. He'll give us what we need financially. He'll give us all. But our heart's got to be right first. If our heart's not right, then he is not going to bless this place. It's not going to be there. We need to make sure our hearts are right first. I don't want your money. I want your heart. (laughs) But it's not for me. It's for God. So, continuing... 
For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion. Zion is the land of God's people. It's, it's defined differently. Sometimes it's just Jerusalem. Sometimes it's all of Israel. Either way, here I think you can say that it's uh, God's people, the land of God's people, a stone. So I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So stands, that word means we find in Scripture. And a cornerstone was the edge of a, of the, of a building that was laid at the foundation that determined everything from the angle of the building that it was supported well all of it was determined from that particular cornerstone it was somewhat of a foundation and a laying to make sure that the structure of the building was sound I am laying a cornerstone that stone is Christ it holds everything together it's essential for the rest of the building in Isaiah, this is quoting basically out of Isaiah 28 in the verses 14 through 19. There are two sides here you see. Those who are loyal to take shelter and hope in death or lies and deception or those that put their hope in the precious cornerstone, righteousness and justice. So God says here in book of Isaiah chapter 28, therefore hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers, who rule, in the people, rule this people in Jerusalem. So this is God's own people that he's talking to. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death. When the overwhelming waters pass through, it will not come to us. It won't have any effect on us. For we have made lies and falsehood our refuge. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation, so absolutely reliable. It's a double word, use of the same word. So it's saying this is absolutely, completely reliable. Whoever believes will not be in haste, will not be careless, rash, or panic. I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line and the hail and the waters will sweep away your refuge of lies. When your covenant with death will be annulled and will not stand when the overwhelming scourge passes through and you will be beaten down by it. When Jesus says in Matthew 7, 24 through 27, everyone who hears my word and obeys them, will be like a man who built his house on the rock, right? The waters will come, the storm is coming, but it will not prevail over that house. It will not. But those that don't listen to what I'm telling them in my word, they hear it, but they don't do it. They built, they're like the ones that build their house on the sand. And when that storm comes, and again, it is coming, it will not stand the devastation will be complete, he says. Listen. So Jesus is the essential place, piece of the, of the house of God. In Revelation, Jesus says to Laodicea, the church, he says to this church that looks like they're rich, right? They've got all this nice stuff. But he says, you are blind, poor, pitiful, and in need. He says, I stand outside your house and knock. Those who open the door and let me in, though, I will sit down and eat with them. Let my rightful place be taken in your house. Make it my house, and I will truly make you really rich. Spiritually, you will be overflowing, which is what we were all meant to be. So are we a community that has reached that point yet? I think we are on our way to it. I think that we are moving in that direction. But that is, is that at our heart? Is that what we want? Is that what we, where, where we are moving to? Are we really the community church? Moraine Valley Community Church. So number two is unbelievers will stumble. So those who honor those that, so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the storm, cornerstone and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So, in Psalm 118, David says, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely 
but he has not given me over to death. This is King David talking. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. And I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. So Hosanna. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Building the house of the Lord is very central to the salvation of God in this earth because it's where his presence is revealed. So honor will be given to those who fully embrace the cornerstone, the Christ. They will not be put to shame. It'll be well worth any opposition that comes against them. But those who refuse to believe in the cornerstone will absolutely stumble. They will be deceived. They will fall. They will be blinded. You ever met anybody where you're just like, how can you not see some of this stuff? How is this just not obvious to you? How is Jesus not clearly who he says he is? Um, that's what it is. It is an element of pride. And that's what you see happen with the Pharisees in the, in the gospel as well. They don't submit to the cornerstone at all because he threatens them. His place of power will replace them and they are not willing to step down the call of the gospel offends human pride to repent and to follow Jesus means that we become servants to God we pick up our cross daily and follow him willingly we are servants of the living God and we are glad to do it glad to do it in Romans 8 verses 5 through 8 it says for those who live according to the flesh they set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set your mind on the flesh is death, but to set your mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Again, why community is so important. Because the world of the flesh is always working on us. A community of God can help us on how to embrace the Holy Spirit and find life and peace. These are the two paths that I just had talked about. The path of God, you have the path then of the world, of wickedness. I've used this analogy before. If you, one path goes to Chicago, the other one down to St. Louis. And all the, I'm not saying anything about either city regardless. But the point is, is that one goes one direction, the other one goes the other direction. If you say, I'm going to Chicago, but you are going to St. Louis, you are in the direction of St. Louis, you are crazy. You are going the wrong way. You need to turn around and head the other direction. The path that we are on reveals our destination. It reveals where we are going. The church was meant to always help people to know where that path is and how to walk on it and in it. So are we a people that truly believe in Christ? If so, our prayers and prayer night will be overflowing with people. Joy will be overflowing because our hope is certain and solid in Christ. Giving of our gifts will be abundant no matter what that is. If it's singing, or if it's performing, or if it's in operations of the church, or if it is financial, whatever it is. Are we there yet? I would say we're moving there. But we need to continue moving in that direction. All right, the final section here, the royal priesthood. It says, but you are a chosen race. 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So what's so fascinating here is in Exodus 19 verses four through six, God says to them, he says, if you obey me, he said, first of all, you saw me bear you on eagle's wings when I brought you out of Egypt. He says, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my my treasured possession among all the nations. You will be the apple of my eye. You will be my treasured possession. And he says, I own everything for the, all the earth is mine, but yet you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words that you so sh shall speak to my people. You know what's so fascinating here is that Peter, who is a Jew, he's telling people who are not Jews. He's using what is only meant for Israel to everyone. All who believe in Jesus now have access to being a holy nation, a royal, divine family that we all can be a part of. That gives me goosebumps every time I think about it. I'm like, do, you, do we realize what we have access to, what we were created for, where we are and what we were intended to be are two different things. And part of the church is meant to bring us from here over to here more and more and more. And if we don't have a church to help us do it, one that embraces the sanctification process, we will never be able to get over here. purpose is to proclaim the excellences of Yahweh called you out of the darkness darkness is such a good visual because it's I think about it I hate the darkness I'm not well I don't know if I'm afraid of it or not I don't think I am but it's dark it's cold it's it's there's it's empty there is no hope there it's terrifying and that's where we were. That's what he's saying here. You were, you were a people that were nobody. You were people that were destined for the wrath of God. That's where you were. And now you are a people that are of light. You are a people who are not just anybody or nobodies. You are part of a royal divine family. You are children of the living God. You are people of mercy and forgiveness and life and not condemnation anymore. You have a reason to celebrate. This is the purpose of humanity. And we've lost it and God is bringing it back. The president of Converge, um, and that's an organization that uh, is helping us to strengthen our church and to... Uh, it's a great organization. It's not a denomination. It's an it's a organization that helps strengthen churches. And we have been working with them. And um, the president is a man named Scott Rideout. And uh, he was telling a story recently that I love the story that he had. A, he, he said one of his first churches that he went to, he started off, he went there, and it was 450 people that were part of his congregation. He said in the first year, I took them all the way from 450 people to 200 people in my first year. And he said, it took me five years to be able to bring the place back up to 450 people. Um, God was doing a lot of work. Some of it needed to be cleared out. Some of it needed to be strengthened and developed. Community needed to be strengthened and so forth. But it took five years for them to get there. If it takes us that long, so be it. Whatever it is, whatever it needs to be. But here's what happened. After five years of them embracing these things, their hearts were right. They were ready for growth. Because once it got to that point then, in a matter of just a few weeks, like three, four weeks, it went from 450 up to 550. Boom, 100 jump, just like that. And then another month after that, one month, four weeks later, from 550 up to 800. Boom, boom. Why? 
Now, I'm not a person that's all about numbers. I don't care if this is a church that always remains small. What I'm saying, though, is this, is that when we are embracing community, God's not going to give us more than we're ready for. If we're not ready for it, it would kill us to have too many people come. It would be too much. It would destroy us. He won't let that happen to his church. But when we are strengthening one another and helping one another, we will be ready for that. And it will grow. And he will bring more people. Last two years, I just found out that we've had a hundred people come here to visit this place. That's not bad. Hundred people. There are many churches that don't get that in many, many years. Many. He'll bring them. He is here. Jesus taught three years in Israel. He walked all over that place. And at the day of Pentecost, there were 3,000 converts that came to Jesus that day. They were ready. They were ready for it. Peter says to them, you went from being worthless to being royalty. That is the path that he has us on. And the last verse here is, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from passions of the flesh which wage war against you. Keep your conduct among Gentiles honorable so that they may speak against you, not speak, so that when they speak against you as evildoers that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. But this is, instead of sojourners and exiles, the better words actually for this would be uh, foreigners and sojourners. As you were foreigners and sojourners. They weren't exiled at this point, um, but rather not at home either. We're not at home. Our home is in heaven. It is not here. We are not at home. This call is for embracing the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. The temptations of the flesh described earlier are at war against the Spirit. We do become like those we hang around with most. Those of you with children, I guarantee you, you said that before. Remember my parents saying that to me and me going, whatever. I'm strong enough to determine my own personality and characteristics and stuff. I rub off on them. They don't rub off on me. Wrong. We become like those that we hang around with most. We need to have a community so that we can rub off on each other. Amen? In conclusion, this is a very Baptist concept. Very Baptist concept. Luke 16, 10 through 12 says that the one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in very much. And the one who is dishonest with very little is also dishonest in very much. The Lord gives us his church and has shown his presence here. What will we do with it? He is watching us, and he's waiting to see what we do with it. He does that with all of us. It's almost funny how often I see that, where he just pushes something a little... I almost feel like an animal getting trained, you know, like a little treat. Here's a little treat for Derek. Here you go, Derek, Derek treat. And I, I look at it, and I go, are you grooming me? <laughs> I feel like it's like, you want that, don't you? Of course I do. Why don't you take it? <laughs> or sometimes it's like, I don't want to walk through that door. Well, that's where we're at. Do you have faith? Yeah, I have faith. Let's walk through that door. Then together, little by little, God does that with all of us. He brings us to places. And we can either embrace Him or we can run back. And He is doing that with us right now. If we push off the work that he does is nothing, then we will get nothing more. Instead, his presence fades away. If we appreciate the house that God is building, then let us take care of it. Let us feed it and support it operationally, financially, gifted-wise, all of it. If we don't, it's not going to be around. It won't stay. But if we embrace it wholly, we will continue to supply it. And I know for absolute certainty that we will not be put to shame. We are living stones which make the house of God. And may we be honored to serve the living God and be a part of building this house. 
So the proposition or the statement today is all for a Je of Jesus, the living stone, will allow him to transform them into living stones for the building of his house. Amen? Amen. Amen.